Welcome, welcome. Um, I am so glad you all could be here today uh, for Abraham's Whiteboard. I'm Jeremy Fricke. Um, many of you already know me. I see a lot of you at this class particularly. And um, I hope you uh, find some appreciation in today's topic, um, which I'll share my screen here. Uh, today's topic will be on the transatlantic slave trade um, and religion, um, which is a, a difficult topic, but we're kind of going to go over a bunch of different pieces of that, and, and we'll get into that in just a second. But um, firstly, I, I do want everyone who's here, everyone who's new to understand that the purpose of this class is to learn about the wide ranging impact of religious diversity around the world, and um, I always try to connect it to Judaism, Christianity, Christianity and or Islam. Um, and, and in some ways, almost everything does. You know, if we, if we really think about it, um, we, can, we can look at almost anything, anything through those lenses. So um, today we'll be talking about faith and faiths in the transatlantic slave trade, um, going from uh, framing the conversation to defining some terms, uh, getting some background knowledge necessary to have this conversation. Um, and, and we'll touch really on uh, really four core areas of this. And all of these could be their own course, let alone uh, just one class. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about Islam uh, during the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it's an under-researched, under underrepresented piece of this topic. Uh, we're also going to talk a little bit about uh, traditional African religions, uh, some of the various religious attitudes towards slavery, in particular among Christians and other Abrahamic traditions. And then um, finally, we'll talk a bit about the religious and cultural adaptations that come out of this time period and the ways that they intersect with um, a lot of some of the issues that we have today, actually. Um, so, firstly, again, I want to I want to emphasize that today is just a snapshot. You know, I, if if you're here to learn everything there is to know about the transatlantic slave trade, you will be sorely disappointed. Um, I hope that this inspires you to look into um, various topics within it. Um, I hope this helps to give a little bit of a um, a foundation. Uh, for, for you to look more into uh, the intersections of particularly religion and the transatlantic slave trade, but really the transatlantic slave trade um, at large. Uh, I also hope you walk away today recognizing the, the, the ways that uh, racism and religious bigotry are intertwined, um, the, uh, the negative attitudes toward people on the basis of their race or the negative attitudes toward people on the basis of their religion are um, deeply intertwined. And um, this will have um, a clear connection to that. Um, I also believe that, that a lot of the narrative about um, people who, the Africans who were enslaved in particular, um, often, even, even the most empathetic, uh, gentle-hearted people, often accidentally dehumanize um, enslaved Africans, uh, often kind of assuming that they have very shallow existences uh, before this point and during this point and, and then on. But these uh, folks have experiences. They are fully um, in, engaged in their lives as uh, oppressed of a situation it may have been. Uh, and then finally, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about some of those traditions that come out of the transatlantic slave trade, which a lot of us don't know a ton about, but, um, but I'd love to talk about them a little bit more and how they interact with uh, some of particularly uh, racism as well. <clears throat> um, now, firstly, I'd, I'd like to ask, is there, are there any particular pieces that um, that you would expect from this conversation that, uh, that I'm not going over today? Are there, is there any uh, comment in particular about that? Uh, 
And I may, I may ask a similar question near the end to see uh, if there are certain topics that people would like to dive into further um, along these lines. But um, so firstly, I wanna talk about, you know, who I am and why I am uh, teaching about this in particular. Um, so my, I am, I'm not an expert on all things um, uh, African or African-American or Afro-Caribbean. Um, I'm trained for religious studies and uh, in particular newer religions and newer religious movements. And we'll talk a little bit about those near the end here. Um, I also have a passion for uh, understanding racism in the context of religion. So I am not the perfect expert on every little piece of this. And I, I am sure that many of you have learned things that that fill in some of the gaps that I have. So, you know, don't be afraid to, to allow this to be a community engaged class. You know, you can, you can add to what we are learning about together. Um, so, We, we are also going to not only be reflecting on um, kind of where we are in this conversation, but also where we, where we connect to this history. Um, you know, this is very, this is a multifaceted time period. Um, when we're talking about the transatlantic slave trade, we're talking about um, a, really about 400 years. Um, so again, you know, we're only gonna go through so much today, um, but really, thinking about the importance of religious experience and the um, the ways that, that slavery impacted religious experience um, are, are going to be a theme throughout this. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna start with two definitions. Um, and number one is the syncretic religion. Now, I'm not going to use this tradition or this definition very much today but I think it's relevant to know. Um, and I'll tell you why though, but, but generally a syncretic religion is a religion that is created by a cultural exchange. So um, when there are multiple religious groups, they interact and often people find meaning in pieces of both and a new tradition is formed. Now, um, the reason I don't use it is because um, the truth is, is that all of our religions have had a significant amount of influence from uh, from and between other religions, right? Um, when we think about uh, Judaism, there are Zoroastrians mentioned in the Jewish texts, right? Uh, when we think about Christianity, there are also, uh, this is in the context that Greek philosophy is also uh, walking around in a lot of the community. So the culture exchange is always happening. Um, and I find this to be uh, generally applied to um, particularly people of color and um, kind of used in a derogatory way. But I want, I want people to know that this is something that is behind the scenes when it comes to some of the more modern movements that I'll be talking about later. Um, and, then, and then finally, we also have the transatlantic slave trade. Um, this is not the entirety of slave trade throughout the history of the world. This is a very particular, um, Im important historical moment, uh, particularly between the 16th and 19th century. It, um, sorry, one second. So uh, during this period, we have a significant amount of missionizing and uh, also colonialism starting. And in particular, people from uh, Europe and the Americas and some of the South Americas uh, worked with um, or, or enslaved people from West Africa primarily. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Senegal and Senegambia um, later because it was, even though um, that was some of the first slaves, um, but it's also important to note that transatlantic slave trade is not just to America. Um, America has a particular relationship with it. Um, but also if we look at Cuba, Jamaica, Brazil, uh, Trinidad and Tobago, French Guiana, slaves were taken from their homes and brought 
uh, across the ocean um, for profit for centuries. Um, now, we're going to talk a little bit about Western Africa pre the slave trade. This is not something that people generally look at. You know, uh, religion and the slave trade is not something that people look at generally. Um, but when we, when we think about this Western Africa area here, um, what religions do you think, what, what would you guess is in this area um, in the 16th, 17th centuries? And you can feel free to respond verbally or in the, um, in the chat. And I'll, I'll also uh, um, okay. Islam and native, yep, like indigenous African traditions of sorts. Um, any others that you would guess? So for sure, there is um, there's a significant number of uh, people from native traditions of Africa or indigenous traditions of Africa, as well as Islam. Um, now, uh, so most scholars would expect that uh, over half were from indigenous traditions almost 30% may have been Muslim uh, of that, that were victims of the slave trade. And then up to 10% may have been Christian. Um, there's a mix of Christianity between um, Catholic missionaries and the possibility or expectation of some um, Coptic Christians that, that comes from Egypt, okay. Um, that, that tradition of Christianity comes from Egypt. Um, so I also see a question here um, from William Koslowski uh, about uh, deracination and post-colonial theory as it relates to religion. I mean, um, you, you appear to know something about it. Um, would, you like to, would you like to start? Um, you're on mute, William. Yeah, I know. Okay. Do you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, I'm uh, particularly interested in uh, the effect on an individual's belief if they're essentially ripped from their home environment and put into a new environment where they have to, for survival, they have to assimilate. Now, how do they, do they adapt their religion? Do they try to meld it with, with the accepted religions? Uh, in other words, do they have to synthesize a kind of new uh, set of beliefs, a new set of practices in order to not stand out? Or uh, are the, the rugged individuals, are they persecuted? Uh, what kind of conflict does a person like that face? And for the most part, how did these people uh, adjust? I'm thinking mostly about uh, Louisiana and uh, New Orleans, which for the longest time was the melting pot until the turn of the century when they introduced segregation due to Jim Crow laws. And it seems that before that, before let's say 1911, uh, the African culture was accepted. And um, and it seems that after Jim Crow, it was expected that they have either conform or be segregated. Uh, so how, how do you look at the struggle in adapting your faith? Who did it successfully? And is this the wrong way to adapt your, your religious faith to kind of look to say, look, I have to fit into society. 
And I have to compromise belief, but maybe you can still keep your conscience. So again, that, that's another dichotomy, conscience versus religious beliefs. You know, religious beliefs and religious practice is something external and uh, outward, but your conscience hopefully remains the same. And the way you live your life and practice your life is dependent upon your, your core beliefs, which I think would be based upon your initial religious experience. And I, I think you have some great points. Those are some great framing questions. Um, we'll be talking a lot about that. That's that's really our our focus today um, when it comes to the transatlantic slave trade and religion. Um, and and we'll see here pretty soon. In particular, as it pertains to uh, the um, the various uh, Muslims that were slaves, as well as uh, some of the indigenous uh, people um, who were also brought over. So we're gonna really focus on that. Um, there is a huge amount also of history of focusing on Christianity. I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but um, it'll be one piece of many rather than the focal point of, of today's conversation. So well, I, uh, yeah, I, I would love to continue that conversation. I, I have um, actually a couple of questions about that. Um, uh, pretty soon here. So um, so I mentioned earlier that, you know, a, a significant portion of slaves were, were Muslim in particular. That's not something we imagine. Um, and in particular, especially early in the slave trade, some of the earliest slaves were taken from places that today are nearly 100% Muslim. Senegal in particular um, was probably close to 95% Muslim then and is nearly 95% Muslim today. Um, it's, we don't have all those details written directly. You know, when we, when we try to find the histories of people who, who have been uh, oppressed, marginalized, um, attempted to be destroyed from history, we kind of have to do this investigative method of sorts, right? So we know um, people took people from Senegal right? We know that Senegal was majority Muslim. It's likely that a significant number of Muslims from Senegal or slaves from Senegal were Muslim. That's kind of how we do a lot of the historical research to try to find the lost stories of, of uh, so many enslaved people that their stories were in many ways destroyed, right? We're trying to, trying to sort of uh, find them again, if you will. Um, so I also want to point out here that um, warriors of different kinds were often the people who were enslaved first. Um, now this is a, a long history, you know, slavery and military conflict has a long, long history. Um, when we are thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, this starts with people who, um, firstly, we have we have a, a, a slave trade that is not as, uh, not as commercialized that already exists. Then we also have an interest in slavery from Europeans who come to West Africa and attempt to kidnap people and, and succeed in many situations. Eventually, uh, people find ways to, to create an economic system out of this and um, the slaves that were often traded were those who were defeated in military combat, especially early on. Um, so it's interesting to think that the, some of the earliest slaves were some of the strongest fighters, right? The, some of the most, um, if, if we think about the people who would be fighting on the front lines of war, what would their relationship to their religion be? And that's a question for everybody. It, if if uh, you are a, um, a, a religious person in war, what kind, how, how religious would you likely be if you are on the front lines and you're the ones that are likely to be captured?
Any ideas? It's I'm not looking for anything that complicated. That would depend on what they are fighting for, or you know what the war was about. Uh, you know, also to what their status were. You know, That's as true. warriors. So. That's true, um, and but especially in the medieval and like early modern period, which is kind of what we're talking about here, a lot of warfare, while not necessarily about religion, was often um, put in the context of religion. So people, people who were warriors generally were very religious. Um, they were willing to die to some extent for their religion, regardless of what religion we're talking about. Um, and so we have a significant amount of enslaved people who were deeply devoted to their religion um, being brought to the Americas and to other, um, other countries that received many slaves. I'm seeing a few. Yes, um, you know, that, that's a, exactly right. Um, so it's, it's very likely that um, when we're thinking about particularly the, the Muslim uh, enslaved African experience, um, we're thinking of a significant number of people who are highly religious, likely pretty educated, likely literate, right? And um, live in living as young adults, you know, with families and a uh, significant presence in their religious life. Um, so we, we see very early in the slave trade, you know, I, I, like I said, about 16th to 19th century, uh, Spain starts to panic a little bit. Um, we see a rise of, of uh, African slaves saying, we are not going to deal with this. We're going to get out of here. We're going to figure out how to fight back. Um, and they, uh, they fight, they, they rise up and they, they fight against uh, slavery for themselves. Um, there's a long history of that. That's another thing that is a totally different, well, related, but different topic that should be discussed more is the, the importance of enslaved people liberating themselves that that happened many times throughout the um, the slave trade. Um, so they started to see that in particular, the Muslim community was more passionate about fighting slavery. Um, and Spain, Spain is the main one that saw this, they they tried a whole bunch of different ways to sort of ban Muslims which we hear uh, about even, even today to some extent. Um, but the, you know, first we try uh, geography, you know, okay. So it seems like the people from Senegal and the Middle East and all these other places are the ones that are the problems. And then, and then we're gonna uh, move on to, um, to trying different things. And eventually they, they just decide to make it about religion. Um, and I, I just want to point out this quote um, that this is a deeply that this that slavery has a an important religious context. You know that uh, particularly Spain um, felt very strong strongly that they should not allow Islam to be there because it is attractive. Um, it is an attractive religion to many, so they they were worried about it. So they. They tried to ban that after about 20 years of uh, various attempts, right? <clears throat> um, now, I, I want to ask this question. I know this is a difficult question, um, but what would be particularly difficult to practice, particularly within Islam in this context? You know, there's, there's a lot of important practices. There's a lot of important um, cultural pieces. What would be particularly difficult? Um, and I would love to, yeah, yeah. Oh, you go. I would say just uh, your daily prayers would be very hard. Okay, that's a good point. All right, and and eating, eating of different kinds. 
there's definitely a, a wide range of this, but um, but just thinking about it broadly. I would love to hear from uh, anyone in the Muslim community if they would be willing to, to add to any of these. What would be particularly difficult in this context? Well, the hardest, you know, would be the prayer because it's, you know, physical and visual. Yeah. Uh, you know, dietary, obviously, because Yeah, and uh, I see Bilal has uh, raised their hand. Uh, you'll have to unmute yourself. Uh, oh, there you okay, go. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. This technology, man, gets me. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm a senior citizen having a senior moment. <laughs> I get it. Uh, I think one of the problems, uh, in addition to what everyone else has said, is to be able to communicate with each other in their language. Right. That's that true. was definitely a big issue. That was one of the reasons why the slave traders would separate uh, different tribes so that they could not, not communicate with each other and would mix individuals together so that communication became very difficult. So I think on top of everything else that everyone said, uh, being able to speak to each other, communicate to each other in each other's language and especially in Arabic was a big issue. For sure. These are- I, I, have, a diff I have a different view because I, I think when your freedom is taken away, everything else becomes irrelevant. When you don't have freedom, uh, your life is, uh, you're not free, then that's the only thing that matters. Tell, tell me more what you mean. Well, when you are not free, then what you eat or how you dress or how you speak with others uh, that's probably on the back burner. Your only objective in life is to become free. And you're probably more focused on uh, on freedom or fighting for freedom than, than anything else. True. No matter which religion you belong to. And, there's a, yeah. There's a, there's a part of this where throughout history, whenever we define somebody as an other, that they're not one of us. Um, we homogenize the others. So we see this with Hispanic cultures. Most people that aren't educated or understanding of Hispanic cultures don't realize that Dominicans are different from Cubans, that are different from Colombians, that are different from Mexicans. There's nuances in cultures depending upon where you're from, um, there's nuances in Islam, um, different sects of Islam, just as there is in Christianity. We recognize those sects in Christianity, but when somebody is an other, when we have enslaved them, then, then they're homogenous. We, we strip them of their identity, and the first level of that is stripping them of the nuance of who they are the nuance of their individualist, the family, the tribe, the city, the country, the culture, that all just gets stripped away. And I, I think that's kind of like level one of where the difficulty becomes um, when, when you are, uh, at least from the work that I, I've seen, uh, when you're in oppressed culture, that's, that's step one. Right. And, um, you know there are there are so many uh, concepts within this, but um, let's let's talk a little bit about some of the ways that um, uh, enslaved Muslims did their best um, in a very in the most difficult situation you can imagine, right? Um, because I I want to also the the I want to also uh, appreciate the um, 
the the human spirit of of people who were in the worst situation possible right um and let's talk a little bit about the five pillars um now i'm not going to go into detail but let's talk about some of the ways that um people responded so first is the commitment really uh to islam the first uh, the shahada you know there is no god but god muhammad is his prophet there's um there's a story that um people found a a fugitive you know and i hate to use the lang that language but that's the language that's used um and he all he was saying was uh muhammad allah muhammad allah and um or at least that's what was written down right and um after talking with him they realized he was deeply literate and was able to actually eventually convince them that he was um that he was free or deserving to be free due to his um basically islamic education and ability to uh express himself uh, it was in arabic so they found a translator to to find that out for sure um we also see and this is probably the most clear experience that many many um, enslaved people had and this is pseudo conversion uh, where there's there's an expectation uh, to convert um, depending on the sect of Christianity we'll talk a little bit more about that later but pseudo conversion is where you adopt enough to get by to show that you are converted enough um, but you might not actually convert in your heart or you might figure out ways around it um, we'll talk a little bit more about some of this but an example might be to uh, use the terminology of christianity um, in the context of islam so using you know talking more about jesus in as almost a placeholder for muhammad or uh saying god instead of a law you know those kinds of things are often ways that um that were used to try to retain the belief system that they wanted to keep while still um remaining safe enough um salat or the prayer five times a day i think it's important to note here that there um that the enslaved experience is is different uh depending on where they're at who they're with um you know it's it's different um some slave masters made concessions to keep them from trying to rebel um you know where they would allow some prayer um the most common situation that i could find for this was that they did not want to pray during the day um, and often, instead of doing five, uh, they would try to do one before leaving the the place to sleep, and one after coming back. You know that there would be an an intent to try to do the prayers um, outside of watchful eyes as much as possible. Um, alms also. Um, while th this also uh, changed a little bit over time, you know, you're not getting a lot of money, right? Again, it depends a little bit on the situation, but you get nothing really. And um, if if there's an opportunity to cook for yourself, um, the uh, the alms would often be a sharing of food that. Um, uh, rather than, you know, a, a traditional tithing, it would be sharing of food to others. It would kind of, um, it, it kind of changed exactly how it was practiced. Um, fasting. Uh, there's, there's a many, many uh, explanations of uh, people who, who actually did continue to fast. Halal was not an option, but uh, much of the time abstaining from food um, wasn't going to be punished. Now, th there's always exceptions. 
um, but abstaining from food is not as punished, but that means that you don't get to eat if, if you are uh, avoiding certain types of food and that is. Um, and then finally the hudge, which is probably the most impossible. Um, all of these are extremely difficult and dangerous in many situations. Um, the hudge is off limits, right? This is where uh, you make a pilgrimage to Mecca. I, th I think it again, it's important to note, there were people who lived significant adult lives before being enslaved. Um, many people had gone to Mecca. You know, I, I, think, I think we forget that people had lives before being enslaved often, you know, not, you know, later in the in slavery, this changes a little bit early on, many were enslaved as adults. They had lives before this. Um, one of the more common ways that people kind of uh, lived out the Hajj was through uh, pictures, if possible, of, of the Kaaba or the Kaaba um, in Mecca or drawings, sometimes sand drawings of things like that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of the ways that, that these things were practiced in more specific ways a little later. Um, so before I move on to kind of uh, African traditional religions, does anybody uh, want to add any comments, have any questions about particularly Islam uh, and the slave trade? Yeah. Jeremy, I have one, uh, if I can. Um, I think we are like assuming that Arabic was, you know, widely spoken. So yes, Arabic is the language of Islam and the practices in the Quran, but I, I doubt that it was, you know, widely spoken among the slaves, you know, from West Africa. They may have had a religious you know, knowledge of Arabic, okay, to perform the prayers and, you know, to uh, read the Quran. But I would, I would probably lean towards that the common languages, you know, were their own languages. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's true. Um, although I think it is important to note that, um, and this, this is something I forgot to put on this previous slide is also like, um, Often the Quran was used for the strat the way to gain literacy, right? Um, many some of the languages in uh, in West Africa were not really written at this time, so if there is a written language, they would do Arabic. And I I could be incorrect about this, but I believe that you know educated people, um, educated Muslims in this period may have had. Uh, more, um, uh, what's the word? More, uh, more. I guess more commonly skilled in in Arabic speaking even then. And I know it's it's different. And it's and yes, there's there's a wide range of languages that are also spoken that are probably more comfortable. Um, but there's also no doubt that if if you had to get by, if you had to communicate across lines. Even if you are a beginner of Arabic, that would be um, highly helpful, right? Um, and especially when we're talking about this time of, of Islamic empires um, in Africa, where this would be sort of the unifying language. I, I, but yes, uh, there's no doubt that um, there are a wide variety of languages spoken and, and that not every Muslim would speak Arabic for sure. Uh, Jean, sorry. Uh, this just made me think more deeply, I think, about the trauma. If those people were torn from their homeland, torn from their community, torn from their families, there's illness and death and all the pain that they're encountering. And then on top of it, I mean, those are the things that drive you to your religion I, that shouldn't be necessarily, but those are the things that make you turn to your religion. And for them to be going through all that and then also to be blocked from fully uh, performing their religious activities like they would like to, that's just one more level of trauma I hadn't thought about. 
right? Yeah. Um, and Abu Bakr. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to add, uh, you know, something that, uh, you know, Abdul uh, touched a little bit because, um, yes, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, Arabic wasn't like the common language because, you know, being, uh, you know, originally from us, uh, West Africa, you know, there's a lot of dialect in each country. You know, my country is about 15 million people and then we have almost 60 dialects. So that being said, you know, the, uh, the educated people are the one that, you know, spoke Arabic and then, you know, they were, you know, fluent in Arabic and, uh, and can communicate in Arabic. You know, one of the other things that I wanted to add also is uh, the, uh, the process, you know, I think we skipped uh, a little bit of uh, the process on how, you know, people get captured and, and the process of being, uh, you know, shipped from Africa to, you know, either Europe or, 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 or America. You know, during that, uh, process where, you know, there are in the boats, you know, almost 90% of the survivors are the ones that are strong because, you know, the condition within which, you know, there are chain and, you know, shackle in the boat, if you're not strong, you know, you, you're probably, you know, going to be, you're probably going to be uh, thrown over the boat or, you know, die before you even reach, you know, the other part of the world. So during that process, you know, you are stripped away from everything as far as, you know, your faith, your community, your culture. So that is where, you know, the, I think the, 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 uh, the separation starts where, you know, you're isolated, you know, you are stripped from your family and, and, and everything. And then, you know, the trauma, everything starts right there during that long journey you know, within the boat, you know, before you even get to, uh, you know, to the Americas or, you know, to Europe. For sure. And, and a piece that um, I, th I think I wrote later is um, that eventually they start a kind of, uh, a, a lot of uh, slave traders started a system where they would um, try to enculturate or, or convert um, in a sort of halfway house of sorts. Um, brought to a particular island to go through uh, an education that would eventually um, end in a more in a forceful conversion uh, because they believed that that would uh, that would reduce the likelihood of rebellion and other things. Um, there's a lot of there's a long process of all all of this complicated, intentional, um, you know. It's, it's a lot. Um, I, I see Bilal also has their hand raised up. Yeah, well, uh, uh, Abu Bakr said a lot that I wanted to say, but uh, you cannot fishnet the enslaved Africans because they were Muslim. You can't assume that they spoke the same language, Arabic, just like you can't do that today. Because everyone who embraces Islam, who comes from different parts of the world, they have a native language and normally they speak in that language. So Arabic for them, the majority of them was a religion. And, and so when you say Arabic, but you want to tack on Islam with that, you have to differentiate between really what you're talking about. Are you talking about a language or are you talking about a religion? And, and he did a great job because one of the strategies, as he mentioned, is that while being brought to different parts of the Western Hemisphere, uh, slaves were traumatized mm -hmm. from day one. They were taken from their land, their culture, their language, their people, their food, their dress. Everything that was about them was stripped, period. So to communicate with, with each other was very difficult especially when you're being separated from your, your people. But what I wanted to add was, because you made a very interesting statement when you talked about alms and that, uh, you know, they were allotted just a little money. 
enslaved, the majority of the enslaved people were not given any money. They didn't even under, understand the money transaction that was mute back in those days. And this country and a lot of other countries were built on free labor, not uh, uh, you got a, a certain amount of money from working from sun up to sun down. That's not how it happened, you know? And when it comes to abstaining from food, I, they only got one meal a day. So it was kind of hard to abstain from something that you weren't getting anyhow. And then when they were given food, just like clothing, you know, they were given like two things of clothing per year. And their food was a little nothing. This is one reason why they had to eat the remains from animals that were thrown away by the slave master. That's one reason how they call chitlins. Chitlins, as we know, are the guts from pigs. But that's what they had to eat. And so there were, really was not an, uh, an abstention from, from food. They didn't have any food, bro. You know, I mean, this, this, the, the, those people who were enslaving uh, these human beings, they were human beings. They were treated inhumanely. Historically, there's no record of anyone being treated as inhumanely as those who were captured and brought to the Western Hemisphere. Because even when they were in, when they were in their own homeland and captured by uh, or defeated by foreigners, they still were able, even though they may have been enslaved, but they were still able to stay in their home, their, their own homeland, still eat the same food, still maintain certain things. But when they were brought to the Western Hemisphere, they were stripped from all that. So I don't want to give a, a misconception that this slave trade was by any means humane in any fashion or form. And the low percentage of those who were slave traders and what have you, who could take advantage of someone who was educated, someone who understood business and negotiations, this, that, and the other. I don't want to make it appear that there was a high percentage of that. But if you did your history, you know that was a very low percentage. And the one thing that a slave trader did not want was to have too educated of a enslaved individual because he would be considered, I mean, he would be concerned of a revolt. Yes. Okay, so that it was, that it, 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 it is not like that. And, and I don't want the audience to have a misconception of such a horrific thing. And then I'll close by this. It, from that point on, even when they talk about the constitution of the United States <laughs> and, and the forefathers, they still have not changed that a, a black person, one of African descent, is still just three fifths of a human being. Just three fifths. Well, we got everything that you got physically. But then they're going to say you just three fifths of a human being. That's how heinous this slave trade was and still is today. Because we're still facing the same atrocities that were faced then. They got a different uh, sophistication about doing it. But that's why you have sex trafficking, human trafficking. And what is that? It's the same thing it was doing back in the 1600s. Right. And I, I hope that, you know, nothing I said was intended to defend any piece of this. Um, I, I hope that uh, my, my goal here is to show that in the face of this, this bad of a situation, Muslims put their lives and their bodies 
on the line to try to continue to do their practices as much as they could. That doesn't mean that it was um, that it was easy or or that they let them or any of those things. That tried to figure it out as best as they possibly could. Um, I, I see uh, Pastor Tracy. Yes. Yes, to um, continue on with that. And I agree completely with the statement because it is a fact. For over 400 years and it's still continuing today as we saw with the murders of George Floyd, but it's been since Trayvon Martin back to Emmett Till and on and on is that we were considered three-fifths human from slavery. And the reasoning behind that is the atrocities that were inflicted upon black bodies, you had to look at us as something other than human to be able to do it as objects. And when it came to literacy, you know, being stripped yet again of your culture, your religious practices and all that, and your language, everything, and to come here to these shores and to be given Jesus, a white Jesus at that time, to condone slavery, but then making sure that you were not literate because if the slaves were able to read, they'd see that Jesus came for Jew and Gentile and of everyone, slave and free. There was no slavery in serving Christ. They wouldn't have wanted that because there would have been a revolt. So as long as you could keep the Africans, uneducated, illiterate, and just functioning as bodies, then that is how the slave trade perpetuated and still blacks being seen as less than, as the other. So that is, that is absolutely the consequence and still the unfolding negative effects of slavery. And people in black skin and anyone here, one here is black will know that. And we do know that, and we still live with that, and are trying like this to get, you know, gain more understanding, but to also enlighten those who are in white skin on here. Um, and and I, I'm going to move on to the next section because we're going to continue to be talking about a lot of the things that are brought up here. Um, the uh, because, I, and I I just have I have this piece just to know a little bit about this because it'll come up in a second, but um, we'll come back to uh, particularly the role of, of white Christianity and, uh, and, and really Abrahamic theologies in this, because this is an important piece that, that we can't ignore. Um, I, I want to just mention here that African traditional religions were were also deeply diverse, deeply varied. You know, um, if I, for example, we talk about indigenous American indigenous traditions today, which one are we talking about? You know, there's so many, and and really, it's even hard to say that they have um, so much in common that we can even put them all together, right? They're they're diverse and beautiful and um, and important on their own. Now, just to know the largest group of traditional religious uh, uh, people who affiliated with the traditional religion is, is Yoruba. And really quickly, um, just to kind of have an idea of how this works, there is, there is basically one main God that is the creator distant uh, name is Olorun or Olodumare and the world, is, and then there are sort of, um, sort of like sub gods um, that are named Orisha. They're they're more like spirits, um, and uh, they are the ones that interact with you on a day to day life. Life is full of spirit. Um, humans and trees and stones are visible spirits, and the world is also full of invisible spirits like the Orisha and others. Um, I just want to have that background because this is uh, this will come up in in a few minutes with a a different a little bit different topic. Um, Yoruba is still widely practiced um, in in West Africa and and there's a movement of of interest in the Americas in particular as well to practice Yoruba. Um, now, 
now I'm going to get kind of to some of the things that were were brought up um, by our guests, which I really appreciate the um, attention to the importance of these um, these issues. Um, Catholics and Protestants, and and again, I'm speaking to a wide range, so I want to be clear that when I talk about this, I I should be saying, you know, are we talking about the early period? Or are we talking about the later period? Because this changes, you know, this is a different, this is 400 years. Um, people figure out ways to make things worse, to be honest. Um, it was, so the, generally the Catholic theology on this was that it was ideal for slaves to be Christian because um, there's an, there's an existing power structure in Christianity, according to this situation, according to this theology, that allows for some level of relationship between slaves and masters. Now, this was this was an important part of the process. When I was talking about Spain, that's partially why they stopped. Um, they made sure to either to convert, or they tried to convert slaves before bringing them places. The Protestant slave owner view was that you generally can't enslave Christians at first, okay? That, that if you are baptized, you couldn't really be enslaved. Now, this changes. Um, I, I think this is, this is a, a key point in the history of how racism is, uh, is brought to the masses that um, there's there's a there's this dual motion, particularly in the Protestant community and especially in the Americas, where they they want to um, win souls, but they also want to enslave black folks. So laws are passed to continuously create, like, to solidify the idea of slavery, and in particular, slavery against black folks. And as you see in this quote, I, I want to point out a couple of things really quickly. So this is after, um, after slavery is a condition by birth, uh, according to law, you know, unjust law. Um, there was always there was a question: Does baptism uh, make them free? And this is the the Virginia colony and and many other colonies afterwards passed a law that said. No, um, baptism does not uh, make them free. Baptism does not have anything to do with bondage or freedom. So I think it's important to note here. Now, now why I bring this up is because it requires a theological change, a, 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 on a, a racist theological change in mainstream Christianity at this point to allow slavery right to allow any i mean to allow slavery on the basis of race in particular um, and and to there was a point where christianity would be seen as sort of an equalizer that that doesn't make this right by any means but there's a an attention to humanity at that point and they make the conscious decision to say that even if they share my religion they are not equally human right, that they are able to remain slaves even in that circumstance. Um, I think this is important because this isn't that long ago, right? Um, in fact, uh, well, in one of the biggest theological points that, that started maturing in the century after uh, this Virginia law was the idea of the curse of Ham and the curse of Ham is something that uh, was, and I think we need to be clear about this, this was uh, particularly a tool for Christianity, but it was adopted by uh, uh, Muslims and Jewish folks in the process as well um, to justify slavery of Black people. This, this, this uh, particular verse has made a huge impact on the theology that that is used to justify slavery. And in particular, I want to point out the piece of 
Uh, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Um, and other and later he says, uh, Canaan shall be the servant of Shem. Uh, and Canaan shall be the servant of Jephthah. So this this was used. This wasn't. This has had some racist connotation. I um, this has been used in some racist ways, honestly, for a thousand years. But it it became very. It became pretty mainstream. Um, it became a, a dominant force for this uh, during this period. Uh, Pastor Tracy, sorry. Pastor Tracy, did you want to say something? Um, Belong? Yeah, I, uh, I'm kind of perplexed in, in some things, but I think we can narrow it down regarding slavery. Slavery was a means of making money. Mm -hmm. It didn't make any difference whether you were what your religious ideology was, what your nationality was, or any of that. Slavery was about money, economics. And therefore, anytime a law was changed for the betterment of the majority, then they were gonna do that to maintain the free labor. And that's the thing, you know, we always need to focus on about slavery. Slavery was about money, and it was about free labor. I'm glad you brought up the curse of Ham and how it was used against the enslaved individuals. That's very important. But if I'm, maybe I heard you wrong, but I think you said the Muslims also used the curse of Ham as a means to uh, enslave people. Or did, or did I, I, no. I, I got a little distracted, so I, I may have heard you wrong. And if I no. did, I apologize. So in later, like 1000 AD or so um, history in both Jewish and Muslim communities, it's not about slavery, but it was applied to black folks, if that makes sense, that the curse of Ham was seen as a reason why. Now this, this had been used also to some extent by like abolitionists too, but um, you know, because it's seen as um, an unjust curse in some circumstances, right? But by and large, so it was predominantly Christianity. And um, eventually, Judaism adopts this. And, and like many religious traditions, there are sort of, you know, exegesis or, you know, ex uh, expansions on stories, right? the same expansion was eventually adopted by, by some number of, of uh, Muslim communities as well. Um, again, you know, it didn't, it didn't make the same impact um, as it did for, um, for these folks. But I think it, wh why I bring it up is because if we're talking about religion and the transatlantic slave trade, we have to recognize the the problematic history, even if it, you know, e even if it uh, makes an unequal impact on, you know, depending on our community, if that makes any sense. I know that's, I, I, yeah, I don't know if that came out clear, but um, yeah. Well, so it was least used, honestly, it was least used in Islam, but it, it was adopted by many Muslim communities as well. That's, I just want to be clear that, um, you know, that again, the truth is, is Christianity has a long history here. And uh, the other two are, are not quite as significant in this conversation, but it affects Abrahamic traditions. You know, what we're, a lot of what we're talking about here is the early roots of what some would refer to as the prosperity gospel, where there's this um, sick, marriage of economics and religion and i have a background in economics myself and there are two things in economics that you're taught that are 
that are difficult to deal with. Um, one is resource extraction and one is commodity management. And the dark side of what we've seen here is we turned people into resources. We turned people into commodities and we took our, our religious positions to justify uh, justify those positions. Um, but, but you look at resource extraction and commoditization in any industry, it's never clean. And now just imagine you, you take oil spills, for example, take, go to a copper mine, go to a copper smelting uh, facility. It, it's ugly, but those, are, those aren't people. And when you, when you put people into that equation and you've turned people into resources and people into commodities, and then you, then you're, you can see where those people that started making money, the one percenters of, at the top of those echelons started searching and mining for biblical justification. Um, right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, I saw, uh, I, is it is it Faisal? Um, is, is that yes, Faisal? yes, Jeremy. So uh, I was wondering, were all transatlantic slave masters Christians? Every single one of them. Vast majority. I I don't know if I don't have data on that, but um, the the type of economy, you know, and, and I, I've heard this many times, the type of economy, the money involved, those are things that, uh, if we're being honest, are uh, centered around particularly European cultures and uh, American cultures. So there's a, a dominance of, of Christianity in those. Um, I, I'm sure that there are always exceptions, but, but the vast majority, I'm sure, yes. Um, I think we have to contend with that, that it's, it's mostly white folks, it's mostly men, it's mostly Christians. Okay, yeah, I, I was trying to, to figure out w w what type of uh, Christians, you know, practicing Christians, religious Christians, or were they just Christian by, by birth and did not have a true understanding of, of Christianity? Or, or were they true Christians? Um, it wasn't the, okay, so during this time, the exception to the rule, as far as I can tell, it was uh, a more positive, liberating view of Christianity. That was the exception at this time, not the, not the common. Um, I, I think the, it's the job of the pastor to uh, decide what is the right Christianity, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I, I'll call on Bilal and then Anna, and then, and then we, we should uh, keep moving because I, I have other things that, I, that are related. You know, these are all important. I'm, I'm trying to give a, a broad array here of, of this topic. And we can come back and, and actually have another class specifically on just one piece of this, if, if you all are interested. But uh, Bilal, I saw that you had your uh, hand raised. Yeah, I, uh, in all fairness, um, there were Arabs, and in some cases, some Muslims involved uh, with the slave trade then and afterward. Okay, so I just don't want to put it on the Christians and make it seem like the Christians were just the only ones that were involved. And I, and I appreciate the person's question regarding what type of Christian would this be that would uh, be a participant in such a heinous act. And the same thing can be asked regarding any nationality or race of people who would do that. And we would have to question as Muslims why Muslims would participate in that uh, and separating when you say Muslim opposed to Arabs, because sometimes we're the, the two are joined into one. And so there's a misconception because uh, even in some cases, Africans were involved with enslaving Africans. And, and so I have to allude back to what uh, the brother that was on uh, the second to the last time, and he talked about the economic aspect of it. 
this is one reason we per perpetrated uh, and, and got their will going in regards to slave trade, because again, it was about economics, but it wasn't just white Christians that were involved, you know, and I, I, and I don't want to put that on, like right. I said, when you start fishnetting, you may have a misconception, and there were some, some Arabs that were involved, there were some Muslims that were involved, there were some Africans that were involved, but the majority of the people, whether you were coming from uh, Spain, Portugal, France, Britain, uh, uh, it really didn't matter. They were the majority because they were the majority of the race who was coming there and profiting by enslaving people. Yeah. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Pastor Anna? Yeah, I'll try to be brief because <laughs> I don't want to take up all your time at all. Um, but I do want to just back up something that Tracy said earlier, uh, which was that they didn't want um, this, the people to read um, the scriptures uh, as we kept going, because the message of Jesus was not a message of slavery. It was a message of freedom and liberation, and particularly for the oppressed, which certainly that's who we're talking about here. Um, and so I would answer then, you know, certainly no, those are, those are not Christians um, that are following Jesus that are doing this. At the same time, it would be an entirely, um, it would be a very long conversation if we were to talk about how the church, when it became um, empowered and hierarchical as an organization, um, changed its message from something that was about liberation to something that was about power, hierarchy, and oppression. And that started um, under Constantine and kept right on going, um, mostly in white churches, but certainly not, not only. Um, and so there was a, a, a twisted sort of orthodox Christianity uh, that we're still dealing with uh, today where, where white supremacy um, where there became the message of the day and it was about power and it wasn't about the message and we're, we're still trying to get back to the message of hope um, and liberation found in Jesus. And yes, yes. Um, and I, I just want to kind of um, do this last piece um, ab about particularly Christianity and um, and then I'll ask uh, Pastor Tracy to kind of um, to add anything. Um, the so I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that the slave masters, the people who were in charge of this trade, um, they tried different things because they wanted they, they were they wanted money. They, but to have money, uh, you, you want to have, uh, honestly, the most malleable people, right? And uh, so part of this is, is conversion. Now, at first they attempted with, you know, the, the, if they were Spanish, they'd have Spanish people. But eventually they realized that this wasn't working very well. And they actually would hire uh Black or African um, pastors to have be part of the conversion process, but we find here that um, that their their messages were more liberating, and um, some of those messages kept going throughout generations. Right, um, so uh, again, the slave masters took took the. Uh, the uh, black leaders away and and tried to uh, get rid of a lot of that because again you know as mentioned by Pastor Tracy and Pastor Anna um, reading the Bible uh, knowing the wholeness of of any of the Abrahamic scriptures um, you'd recognize that slavery is not acceptable um, and not only that but you know it's it's justified to liberate yourself right it's justified to to uh, to seek freedom, right? Um, and and a lot of that comes from, in particular, the Moses narrative of um, you know finding freedom after slavery, as well as uh, 
Jesus's focus on the poor and the downtrodden. Um, Pastor Tracy. Yes. You know, in looking at it from transatlantic to being here on these shores, Christianity has been sadly enough the culprit, the driving force in perpetuating slavery and racism. You know, it was the driving force but during slavery, good white people and white people knew what the Bible said about slavery. They knew it, but it was money was the driving force. Then during the Night Riders, Christianity was used again by those who created terror, Ku Klux Klan, and by day they were pastors at night, just monstrous. Through the civil rights and even now, Christianity said Sunday is the most segregated time of, of, of the week, you know, and just the fact that it continues under the guise that it's just good Christians doesn't mean there are not. But racism is very much alive and well in the church. And having these conversations is good, but it's about what is going to be done about that. And that's probably a crawl, sadly enough, if we want to be truthful, all the Abrahamic traditions. And until that is starting to be addressed and some action is taken, we'll continue to have these conversations. Thank you. Uh, Abdul, did you want to add anything? I saw your other, hand. Other than I love how you jump into controversial topics and you are brave in doing this too. But um, but Roger was right in that the driving force to slavery, you know, was economic because everybody had benefited here, be they Arab slave traders, um, white slave traders, even the African tribes who uh, defeated, okay, you know, other tribes and, you know, sold the captors. I mean, everybody made a profit out of this and it turned, you know, in independent people, a fiercely proud people, a people who came from a continent that had empires that rivaled empires in the East and rivaled empires in the West and became just, you know, human, you know, chattel. You know, that's, yeah. that's, it's just, you know, a sad you know, case in humanity. It really is. I mean, there's no one out there that, that is uh, without sin. It really isn't. And and I, I, I do want to reiterate uh, one more time before uh, moving on to kind of our, our last section about this, um, that the intention of this is again not to explain how like religion is the motivating factor or that religion is the most important factor but how religion is a factor in this conversation um and uh you know just understanding like i agree that it is money first but people are willing to change their entire view on even you know things as important as like afterlife and meaning of life to retain their position of wealth and money, right? And in it, they start to believe it, right? Um, it changes the whole culture and it is something that we all need to work together to, uh, to be better with. Um, now, I, I want to uh, kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of do this quickly, and and maybe, maybe, um, maybe we should have another class about this. You know, <laughs> I think it's clear that I, I did too many things at once, um, as I often do. But um, we'll come back to uh, this related topic um, soon. You know, I, I think this is an important one. Um, <clears throat> so I, very early on, I can't remember who it was, but someone mentioned, you know how does it survive, right? Um, I am, I want to ask a question here and this is not the only way, there's so much more complexity, but I wanna start with this question. What, what do you think of when you hear the word voodoo? And you can type in the chat or say it out loud. Black magic. All right. Do you mean, do you mean uh, black 
skin magic, black dark magic, <laughs> like which or both? Both. <laughs> um, I'm I'm trying to see what what's the right word to use. Um, well, it's magic, but not just magic, but uh, magic that. Uh, um, uh, well, when I find the right word, I would come back. Sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. Tribal African spirituality. All right. That's good, too. And I, I also see voodoo dolls, which is probably the thing that if we were to take a pulse of the country, that would be the thing that people would say first is the voodoo doll, right? Um, now, I, I want to also say that voodoo dolls are not a significant part of voodoo. Um, they are a tiny, uh, tiny piece in some communities and not even that important in those usually. Um, they were probably created to, uh, again, uh, create a lot of racism uh, intermixed with religion, right? So um, there's, there continues to be this intermingling of uh, racial and religious bigotry, in particular as it pertains to some of these traditions, in, in my personal opinion at least, that um, the racism and the religious bigotry are hard to fully separate about how we, uh, how we talk about voodoo or um, hoodoo or any other kind of related uh, African spirituality. Um, you know, the first movie, as far as I know of in America about these are in the, is in the early thirties with white zombie um, at a time that of course was so racist that uh, even the, even the people who, that, that everyone is white in the movie, you know, um, even though that's not the, not the movie, you know, um, there's, there's a long history of using voodoo dolls in culture to try to uh, connect black people, African people to, uh, to zombies, to, um, to kind of dark magic. Um, but yeah, I'm going to try to go through this quickly to get you out on time, <laughs> but, um, voodoo is usually pe people who practice voodoo today usually see themselves as about like 90% Catholic and 100% voodoo. That's a, that's a kind of silly saying um, that, that they don't necessarily uh, contradict each other, that they are kind of um, they speak to different parts of life. Um, that voodoo is a little more everyday kind of thing, Catholicism, because usually these are combined. Um, again, uh, these are usually combined. The um, Catholic is more afterlife and like whole meaning of life. Um, voodoo is uh, kind of comes from uh, uh, West Africa from with a tribal religion called Vaudan. Vaud you know, at least that's the French way of saying it. You know, of course, we're talking about a huge history of colonialism and all these things. I don't even know how you would say it in, uh, in the original language, but uh, it, it goes to Haiti as voodoo, and then it comes to Louisiana as voodoo. Um, and there's, there's this long history, you know, and a lot of this academics would say at least that, that a lot of this comes from the, the slave trade. You know, this is, um, a, this is one way that people have uh, tried to have, um, have original religions or, or traditional religions survive in those contexts, right? Um, and really quickly, you know, voodoo, um, just to show you, you know, uh, the, the, what, what they call God is in bon Dieu, uh, the uh, good God is what that means in French. Um, and they have Iwa, which are spirits that are often correlated with saints uh, again, you know, very has some of those similarities to Yoruba that we talked about earlier, as well as um, ways to uh, adopt parts of Catholicism as well. Um, 
Now, my point with this in particular is that this, these traditions have been practiced a long time. And as soon as we get into the reconstruction era, we start to see a, a retaliation against these. Why is it that, um, that we have articles written by white newspapers that say things like voodoo's on the rampage and the full particulars of the hell broth and orgies that are about voodoo practitioners? Um, I want to be clear that this wasn't a big deal. Voodoo wasn't a big deal in the Americas until this era. And, uh, and the main reason why is because finally we have white women interested in the tradition, interested in being part of the tradition because it actually has a stronger role for women than most traditions, uh, most religious traditions, if we're being honest. So you have, um, you have a lot of women in power in these situations. And like much of the narrative in um, the era after, after emancipation, um, we, we see this, these different ways of trying to keep black people down, um, sometimes really explicitly and sometimes uh, in more roundabout ways, like uh, attacking the religion itself, right? Um, this was, and you can read this uh, quick uh, little quote here. This was from uh, a an expose on voodoo from a white guy who um, uh, who was saying, you know, that white wealthy women are interested in this. Uh, they're, I mean, they say all these circling around promiscuously. At the end of the day, they're just talking about dancing. You know, um, this is a very harsh way to talk about dancing. Um, but uh, since I'm trying to kind of finish it up quick here, um, the black newspapers uh, knew that these things were made up, right? Um, I'll, I'll just read this really quick. Uh, a, a, a black journalist uh, wrote this that for my part, I only wish that there was such a power as the basically the voodooism that is talked about um, in the popular culture here, known to uh, black folks of the South or elsewhere, that they might practice a little of it on their white adversaries. That this would, I, you know, I wish this would work to. Um, to be a force for liberation for black folks. Um, okay, I think, I don't think I have time for any more pieces, but I, I do want to show, um, these are some of the resources we used. You know, I, I was very intentional about uh, using um, some uh, mostly scholars of color and women of color in particular, um, Servants of Law is a particularly interesting book um, that I think I think a lot of uh, people should read. It's actually not that hard to read either, um, and it's it's really great. All, all the others are great too. Um, they're just shorter. So, um, thank you all, and I would love to. I'm I'm happy to stay as long as people would like to talk about any questions they have or any comments or concerns. Um, and whether they would, um, uh, you know, are, are you interested in having further conversations along this topic? Um, are there other things? Yeah, Bilal. I think you've done a fantastic job. And I don't know you, but looking forward to meeting you. Uh, uh, when the gentleman said that you've taken something big on your shoulders, and I believe that you had, and I thank God for uh, your courage and your sensitivity and concern. Um, I would suggest that for some who are not familiar with, and I can make it real short, it's a small pamphlet. Um, it's called a Willie Lynch letter. It's very short, uh, but it was very interesting that this man had the, and I hate to use this word, but he was ingenious enough to study 
the behavior of, of the enslaved individuals and a horse. And I think it's like 20, 30 pages, something like, like that, if that many. But it shows you how he presented uh, a, 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 uh, a package to give to slave owners and how they could control their slaves, not destroy their product because their product were the enslaved. And I think it would be, well, I don't know if this is five, six, seven dollar little uh, booklet, but I think it, it would behoove you to read that to kind of get an understanding of what's going on. And, and, and I don't want to say too much because I'd like for you to read the book. But one of the things that the most unique thing that he said is that if you apply this, his theory could last for 100 years. I mean, 300 years, I'm sorry. And it is true today. But you have to read to understand the components that he put together to understand that. And if you learn or read or anything on how to train a horse, it's very interesting how he could put together, correlate between a horse and a human being. So again, thank you. I appreciate all the responses from everyone. Forgive me for being long-winded, but I'm African-American. This is a very sensitive topic. I'm also a Muslim. It's a very sensitive topic. And because uh, in Islam, Islam does not practice racism. It doesn't practice sexism and classism. But that doesn't mean that we don't have Muslims in the Muslim community who don't do that. And a lot of us who are Muslim will not stand up to the plate and admit some of our uh, uh, bigotry. And uh, so therefore, thank you for this opportunity and I hope you'll be able to do it again. Well, thank you so much for, for all your comments. I think it's it's added a lot to the discussion. That's what I always hope out of this, uh, this class is that this is an opportunity to learn from each other. I may lead the conversation, but I hope that I'm not the only one speaking. Um, if if you uh, send me the link to uh, what you'd like uh, people to read, I can I can uh, send it in the recap email also. All right, great, great. I just need to know your you know your email address or whatever. Yeah, I'll type it in the chat also. Also, um, in the chat we have a link here uh, for the survey. If I would love for you, um, everyone here, to um, to fill out the survey, you know, any, any, uh, particularly any suggestions for improvement. You know, I, I appreciate uh, all the kind feedback as well. Um, and, you know, we just try to, we try to continuously improve the program. So it's always helpful to see what, what people think. Um, yeah. And if you have any ideas for future uh, programs, you, you know, whether it's a more specific Thing associated with anything that we talked about today, or whether it's a totally different topic, you know, feel free to throw it, um, either email it to me or uh, even throw it in your uh, survey response. Uh, there's some open boxes near the end. Happy to, happy to be here. I love, I love uh, this stuff and um, everyone's always welcome. Um, you know, make sure you invite friends and uh, you know, spread the word about all the all the ways that we uh, we try to educate and, and build relationships in the community and advocate. And you know, we do a lot of things um, at Tri Faith and and with our partners. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for for coming. And I'm gonna stay in here until I'm the last one here. So. Uh, <laughs> so. Um, Writing, Jeremy. You can like wipe your brow, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Yeah. I, Jeremy. Uh, yeah. Jeremy, back at the beginning of your presentation, where you showed the map. Oh yeah. Did I miss? Did I misread that? That a huge part of the slave trade went to South America, much more yeah. than North America. So I I wanted. I, I didn't really have time to go into that piece because that was going to be kind of the last sections is sort of the 
not only the other ways that uh, religions were practiced, but also the, the, the fact that, I mean, there are countries that were created, you know, not, not just created by enslaved people, but consist almost entirely of descendants of, of enslaved people, right? Of African enslaved people. Uh, for example, uh, you know, um, like Jamaica, uh, for example, you know, is, is very largely populated by descendants of slaves, um, many of the countries here. So Brazil um, had a huge slave trade. Now, uh, part of it also is that eventually the United States, I can't remember what year, decides to not allow the importation of enslaved people. They only allow like, you know, people who were born slaves. So that that changes over time. When we're talking about the slave trade, we're talking about that whole period, but this can be a little bit um, misleading because of that, uh, because there's, this is, this is talking about people who were captively brought from Africa directly to these countries. And there's a lot more trade and movement happening of slaves than just this chart. This is just kind of the most easy to explain version. Um, but yes, there's, there's a whole history of that in Brazil, especially, but Bahia is a huge uh, community of descendants of slaves, um, uh, British Guiana, uh, Cuba, like, so, um, you know, we have uh, Brazilian uh, Santeria, which is kind of like voodoo, and Cuban um, Candomblé, which is, again, a little bit like voodoo, where there's, there was clearly, um, clearly abuse of slaves trying to remove their religions, but they figured out ways to some extent, and, I, and I'm making this too simple, but they figured out ways to keep some of their old traditions alive in the context of the traditions that were being forced, forced upon them. Does that make sense? Yes, so, yes. So voodoo is a little bit like that. Santeria is a little bit like that. Condomble, they are special in their own ways, um, but they, they have a lot of similarities because of the the way that they uh, the way the slave trade impacted Brazil, Cuba, and uh, the Americas, Haiti. Yeah. So I I, I, I spent uh, two months in Haiti after the earthquake, uh -huh. uh, working for USAID projects, and. Um, that was my first realization. The Santeria and the Voodoo churches were side by side. And I had never realized that Voodoo was it was it was one of my first eye-opening things realizing that there was a lot of stereotypes built into that. Yeah, for sure. And I I also want to mention that if you are interested in learning a more personal narrative about Voodoo, um, there's a book called Mama Lola. Uh, uh, here, I'll write it down here. Uh, it's, uh, it's titled like that, Mama Lola, Voodoo Priestess in Brooklyn. It's a biography of a, a very important woman in Brooklyn who, um, who really led the voodoo and Haitian communities um, in Brooklyn for, for decades. And um, it really does help you to humanize it. You know, I, I think a lot of people have this kind of like, oh, this is, this is dark and, uh, and scary and evil, right? A lot of people have those feelings about it. I think it's important to, um, to allow ourselves to step in other people's shoes. And, and this book in particular is a, is a really great one for that. We actually read it in a, uh, the Interfaith Book Club, which is not led by me. If you want, if you want to join that, let me know, and I'll give you the email for that. Um, but yeah, did you read any of that, Abdul? Oh, you're muted. 
So that was read before I I became active in the but it does sound you know interesting. So I'll it's a big it. book, but it, yeah. But it's not too bad to read. It, it's got a lot of you know uh, foreign language, but other than that, it's not difficult. Okay. You know, kind of uh, French Creole language. Um, yeah. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Any ideas for you know what what would you like this class to be? We have we have a few topics for the next few months, but. Uh, but I'm always looking for new ones um, going forward. Hey, I have an idea, but I can talk to you about it tomorrow when I see you at Temple at the library thing. Will you be there? So, okay. Yeah. All right, but great topic, controversial, tough. And I know you sweated off about five pounds today from all the questions. And But great job, man. So have a great night, everybody. Nice seeing everybody. Thank you. Bye. All right. Anybody else? I see Roger and two tri oh, staff just... members and two clergy. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I was just typing a message replying to, to someone, but uh, thank you for doing these. We really appreciate it. I'm new to the, my wife and I are both new to the to this church and sorry there's a little bit of banging going on in the uh, background but um this is wonderful thank you we're really enjoying the countryside uh community yeah. and uh, look forward to being more involved yeah yeah let me know if uh you know if you um need pointed any directions or anything i'll uh i'll be glad to help in any way um you're welcome to everything uh you know come to everything if you want <laughs>